Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so happy to have you here with us today. If you're in person or online, or if you're at one of our campuses, Torrington, New Britain, Cherryville, we welcome you here. We are so excited to have you here. And I uh, want to let you know, next week we're going to be starting a brand new series called I Doubt It. And what we're going to be doing is taking a look at doubt. You know, doubt is something that, that many of us deal with, doubt in God, doubt in our faith, doubt in our own selves. So we're going to be taking an in-depth look over the next several weeks in that. So that's going to be starting up next week. This week we are finishing up our series on party crashers. And throughout this series, we've been taking a look at different parties in the Bible, parties that have gotten crashed by, by somebody or something. And, and you know, we started talking about the, the four guys that brought the paralyzed man to Jesus. We talked about you know the, the, the lost son and coming home and then the older brother seeing the party and being upset and frustrated. Talked about the, the woman who poured out uh, the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. You know, we've talked about a, a lot of different parties throughout this, but this one that we're talking about today wasn't really a party that was, was crashed per se, but it was a party that was almost destroyed, almost destroyed. You ever been to a, a, a wedding where something went wrong before? Anybody went to a wedding? Okay, you know, it seems like, like weddings, things tend to go wrong. I've been to, to a lot of weddings. In fact, I've performed a lot of weddings, and sometimes I'm the cause of why something goes wrong. In fact, I did a wedding once, and, uh, and, and we're there, and we're, we're going through it all, and, and I, you know everything's beautiful, it's hot out, I'm sweating through every layer, including my jacket, and, uh, and, and we get to it, and I'm, I'm about ready to pronounce them husband and wife, and I forget that we never did the vows. You know, it's kind of an important thing to do, I, and I was like, oh, before we do this, though, don't we have some vows to do? And uh, kind of covered it up there. But, you know, it seems like, like, like weddings, sometimes things go wrong. And, and this is a story about a wedding. Now, John, in the book of John, the apostle John, the, the same John that always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, which I absolutely love that about himself. He's just like, you know, just so everybody knows. Jesus loved me more. You know, I'm the favorite. I'm the favorite disciple. Um, he he lists uh, seven miracles in his uh, in his book, and and this is kind of a funny one, and it's one that a lot of us we don't get uh, too excited about. Honestly, it, it, it's the miracle of Jesus turning the water into wine, and we don't get that excited about it because many times we'd rather hear uh, of a miracle Jesus doing where he's healing a leper or someone who can't walk. We love the stories about, about Jesus casting demons out of people or, or a dead person coming to life again or even Jesus going for a late night stroll across the surface of the water. Those are the exciting miracles. This one is just kind of an odd one. And it begins here in John chapter 2, verse 1. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. So, so we're going to take a look at this uh, piece by piece. It says, on the third day, this is three days after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. So Jesus is baptized. Now he goes around and he starts inviting people to be his disciples. We don't know how many disciples he has by now. Maybe around five disciples. And most likely these guys didn't know what they were in for. These were people who already had jobs. They had a career laid out for them. Which is kind of odd. Because most Jewish boys, they would have wanted to be a disciple of a rabbi. But for the most part, once they passed the age Age of around 13 years old, the opportunity closed. If you were not the smartest or the brightest, you would not get the opportunity. You would go into the family business. And all of these who Jesus called were not the smartest and brightest. These were the ones that went on to the family business. They didn't really have what it took to be a disciple of anybody else. So here they are, though. They're following Jesus, this ragtag group. They don't really know what they're even in for. And now Jesus is going to a wedding. We don't know who the wedding was for. We don't know if Jesus or, or his mother were related to them or if they were just friends of the family. We don't really know. But we do know that Mary probably had somewhat of a prominent role in this wedding ceremony. Now, weddings then were different from weddings today. First off, 
T- today, it's kind of traditional that the girl or the girl's family will foot the bill or a large part of the bill for the wedding. Back then, it was the guy who was paying for this thing. So he was paying it, and, and it was a demonstration of his ability to take care and to provide for a family. This was not a normal wedding. We go to a wedding, it lasts a few hours. These weddings will last about seven days long. I mean, this was a party that just didn't stop. It was a long party. They were just partying. They were getting together. They were doing all this. And, and, and it was, you know, much like today, they didn't want to mess up because because the better you did with this, it kind of demonstrated your, your standing in the community. And if you messed up, this would be humiliating for the bride, the groom, the whole entire family. Not only would it be humiliating for them, but it would also be an insult to the guest. In fact, Things that could go wrong in the wedding were actually subject to lawsuit. Imagine that. The people who came to the wedding, if they were not satisfied with the wedding, they could actually sue you for it. So like no pressure at all here. Here's this wedding. Everybody's like, we're just waiting for you to mess up here. Now, in our life, though, we all face a crisis, and they faced a crisis too. It says, the wine ran out. Like, 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 what kind of wedding is this? Imagine going to a wedding and the wine running out. That's what happens. The mother comes over and says, Jesus, they have no wine. This was a crisis because now this reflected poorly on the family, that they did not plan adequately. They did not provide adequately. And in our own life, many of us, we face crisis Maybe not a crisis like this. Maybe it's a different kind of a crisis. But when we face crisis and hardships in our life, where do we turn? When we are fired, when we failed, or when our life is falling apart, where is it that we turn? Where do we turn when we're broken, when we're burdened, and when we're beaten down? Where is it that we turn in our life? Have you ever noticed that in life sometimes things get worse before they can get better? Sometimes things have to get much worse. And for the, 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 the bride and the groom in this situation, things were starting to get very, very bad. They had a problem. The problem was they ran out of wine. How can we party without enough wine was what they were thinking. Some of you are like, I don't know. I feel a little uncomfortable about this. I'm sorry. It's in the Bible, so deal with it. But the one thing I do know is this, in your notes, is that our problem is an opportunity for God's provision. Our problem, the problem that we have in our life, just as the problem here was an opportunity for God to provide, for Jesus to provide, the problem that you have in your life is also an opportunity for Jesus' provision. As it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, and my God will supply. He will supply what? Every need, underline those words, every need, and my God will supply every need of yours according not to your capability, not to your skill, not to your good looks, not to your intellect. He will uh, uh, supply according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So here they are, they're having a crisis. But the one thing I know about miracles is that in your notes, you can't have a miracle without a crisis. You ever notice that? Like, we all want a miracle, but we don't want a crisis, right? It's like, I want the miracle without the crisis. There is no miracle if there's not a problem associated first. There is no miracle. There is no healing unless you first have a sickness. There is no resurrection unless there is death. There is no freedom if there is not addiction. And so here they are. They have a crisis. The husband clearly was not prepared for this ceremony. Either that or there was a lot of heavy drinkers at this party, and they just plowed through it all. And it shows to everybody, he didn't have what it takes. Running out of wine was tragic. It was a huge disgrace. You know, it's always embarrassing to run out of something, isn't it? If you have a party, you have a get-together, whatever it is, and you run out of something, that's embarrassing. This is why, when I was growing up, my dad had a philosophy. And it was, it's better to have too much then not enough, right? Better to have too much than not. So as a result, he would usually buy three to five times what we could possibly consume in a gathering or a get-together, and we'd have tons of food. There was plenty. Everybody always had enough to eat, but we'd also be eating leftovers for days and days and days on end because he didn't want to run out because it's embarrassing 
to run out of something. It's embarrassing. Imagine having this party, all your friends, your family, everyone is there. You're putting on this great spectacle, and now the wine has run out. But see, some miracles can only happen when you've run out of something. Some miracles can only happen when, when the thousands were hungry on a hillside, when there was leprosy. When there, some miracles only happen when we're, when we're empty. Some miracles only happen when we have desperation in our life. See, God doesn't move when you're full of all of your plans. I got plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. I got all the plans, and, and God's just sitting back saying, okay, well, well, let me know when you've run out of your plan. M maybe God doesn't move in the same way when your bank account is full. See, he moves when we've run out of options, when we've run out of answers. Some of us, we feel that right now. We feel like, I don't have any answers in my life. See, at that time, now we begin to see our need for Jesus. Now we realize, wow, I'm at the end of my rope. Now the only one who can make anything out of this mess is Jesus. And it's important for us to admit when you've run out. Admit when you have hit rock bottom. See, because when we're in those positions, when we realize that we've run out, when we realize that our supply is gone, when we realize these things, now it puts us in a position to receive God's miraculous power. In your notes, don't just run to Jesus when your options run out, though. Some of us, that's the only time we ever come to see Jesus, right? It's the only time we show up at church. It's the only time we pray. It's like, oh, well, you know what? All there is now to pray, and prayer becomes our last resort rather than our first response to the situation. Is prayer something that we only do when we've run out of everything else? Or is prayer something that we do each and every day we're coming to God? So don't allow yourself to only come to him when the options run out. But in this case, everything else had failed. And now the only place to turn was to Jesus. Maybe, maybe in your own life you feel empty. You feel empty. Maybe you've tried everything you can think of to get back up on your feet again. Maybe you've tried everything, every program, every meeting, and you can't break the bondage in your life. Maybe you just can't feel like, like you can get your faith back on track again. Let me tell you, Jesus is ready and willing to save you, and he never gave up on you, and his supply will never run dry. The problem is, though, for many of us, we're living in verse three of that story. Verse three of the story, which is, they ran out of wine. They have no wine. We're, we're living there. What is the wine in your life? Maybe we've run out of joy in our life. Maybe we've run out of health. Maybe we've run out of hope. Maybe we've run out of money, and it's, it's gone, and it's been gone for a long time, and you're at the end of your rope. And it feels like we've run out of options. Many people are experiencing terrible circumstances. You've run out of wine, expecting a, a scholarship and you didn't get it, expecting a promotion and you didn't get it, expecting a proposal and you didn't get it, expecting a child and you didn't get it. And it's like the wine ran out. We've lost our jobs, we've lost our friends, everything is gone, we're broken, and I don't know, I don't know where else to turn. When we're in those situations, who do we turn to? What do we turn to? Who, where do we turn to fix our problems? Do we turn to the government? Good luck with that one, right? Maybe we turn to a substance. Maybe we turn to alcohol or drugs. Maybe we turn to a, a job or to money. Maybe we turn to any number of things to help to get us out of the situation that we're in. But instead, maybe what we should do is follow Mary's example here. And she turned to Jesus. She comes up to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, they have no more wine. Continuing on with the story here. Verse 4, John 2. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. This verse always shocked me. I don't know if it shocked you. I would never say that to my mother. Even to this day, if I said that to my mother, my dad would beat me so much, okay? Like, like, I, I would not, okay, so, so when I was growing up, See, I grew up in New England with Southern parents, okay? And so there was a certain level of Southern hospitality, one thing of which was saying, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And I would have teachers at school that say, I don't want you to call me ma'am. I don't know what their problem was. They thought they weren't old enough to be called a ma'am. And I said, with all due respect, I'm much more afraid of my father than I am of you. So I'm going to call you, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. They're like, no, you won't. I'm like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's like not taking that risk there. Here's Jesus. 
His mom's like, they ran out of wine. Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I don't know if he was being disrespectful. I think he probably wasn't being disrespectful here. It just kind of comes across that way in our translation. But then look what his mom does, right? His mom doesn't even respond to him. She, like, ignores the fact that he even said words out of his mouth. As moms do sometimes. Um, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay, here, here, here's a little thing. Some of you guys out here, you're looking for your life verse, right? Okay, if you're a man, do not use this verse ever once in your life. You know, somebody, your mom, your spouse, whoever comes up to you and says, can you bring out the trash? Woman, what does that have to do with me? It will not go well for you. I guarantee you, okay? Don't use this verse. Um, just don't go there. Anyhow, Jesus does it, though. He's like, what does this have to do with me? She's like, uh, whatever. Uh, just do whatever he says to do. Now, how did she know? How did she know that he could fix the problem? As far as we know, this is the first recorded miracle ever in Scripture. It's the first recorded miracle, Jesus turning water into wine. How did she? She comes up to Jesus and says, hey, they ran out of wine. Hey, that's not my problem. He's like, she's like, okay, hey, do whatever he says. And it just makes me wonder, like, had Jesus been practicing this at home, you know? Like he's 13, 14 years old, mom gives him a glass of water. He's like, oh, thanks for the wine, mom, you know? Like, I don't know. I don't know what was going on there. But she knew. She knew what he was capable of. Maybe, maybe they get together and say, oh, Jesus, you know, we don't have any wine. He's like, I got, I got you, mom. I don't know what the situation was, but mom knew that he could take care of it. And also, this tragedy did not catch God by surprise. So this is a typical mom, though, right? She's like, you go do this, and... He's like, no. And she's like, oh, he'll do it. He'll listen to me. He'll do this. And so Jesus, you know, he, he begins, he tells the, the servants what to do, and, and, and then they begin to do it. And, and it starts with, with the servants being obedient to him. And, you know, it's God's miracles begin with our obedience. And, and, and they, they listen to him. So there's a social status that they have to provide wine, to provide good wine, and plenty of it. We got to keep the good times rolling. Now, it's kind of weird, though, because... In some ways, right, this isn't miracle material. I don't know if you thought about that before. Like, like the guy who's like paralyzed, the guy who's blind, you know, the woman with the issue of blood, the person with leprosy, like that's miracle material, right? Running out of wine at a wedding, like, I don't know, that's not really miracle uh, material. This is not a prayer that most of us would ever pray. God, give me more wine, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, we don't normally pray that. Like, God, the bottle is empty. Could you please fill it up again? Like, like we're, not, we're not normally praying. And if you are praying prayers like this, um, you might want to check into a recovery group or something like that, you know, just saying. Um, but it's kind of a funny thing. It's kind of a funny request to say, hey, Jesus, uh, we got to keep this party going here. Verse 6, it says there were six stone jars. How many stone jars? Six, right? They were there. They were there for the Jewish rites of purification. So they had these ceremonial cleansings. They'd have to go and they'd have to wash their hands and wash things in certain ways. And, and they, they had the stone jars there that would keep the water for all the ceremony stuff. They'd probably used it earlier on. There's these jars there, six stone jars, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you've kept the good wine until now. Now, okay, so that's the whole miracle. If I was the savior of the world coming to this earth, I don't know if I would have used my power to bring more alcohol to a wedding. Like, I'm just being honest here. I don't know if I would have done this. Uh, you know, honestly, I think there's a lot of Christians that wish this wasn't even in the Bible. Like, they wish it was, you know, it's, it's like, you don't let the world know that you're the Messiah by keeping the party going, right? Imagine that. It's like saying, okay, we ran out of wine. I got you guys. We're going we're gonna to do this. We don't like it. So you know what a lot of people do? A lot of people, they, they start using this as a metaphor, 
right? They start trying to say, well, actually, see, when Jesus did communion, it was the wine. And the wine was representative of his blood. And they were using these stone jars, which were representative of the ceremonial cleansing. But now he turned the water, and Jesus is the living water. But now it's transforming into the wine. And that represents the blood. And it's like, hold on. How about they just ran out of wine at the wedding? <laughs> And Jesus turned the water into wine. Like, let's keep it simple here. Let's not get too fancy with our understanding of Scripture here. But we don't like it. But, man, so we kind of like, we, we don't want to talk about this a little bit. In fact, some people are like, well, you know, it actually wasn't alcoholic wine. It was actually more like grape juice. And I'm like, well, then why did they get all excited about it, right? Like, you got a, the party, and it's going on like, wow, you broke out the Welch's. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I, I, we, we have to look at the Bible with a real accurate understanding. So, so here, you know, it, we, we try to hide behind this thing. And yet, I, it kind of helped. I kind of wonder, like, if you went around to your friends who are far from God and say, hey, guess what the first miracle Jesus ever did was? He brought a lot of wine to a wedding. They might be like, wow, <laughs> I want to go follow this Jesus, you know? I, I want to go serve him. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe they want to worship him. But I also wonder, when they drew this out, like, at what point did it turn into wine? Like, like they, they're filling up these jugs, and it's water, and then they bring it. Like, when they scoop it out, do they see that it's still water, or is it already turned into wine? Like, they bring it to the master of ceremonies. They bring it there. Now, here's the thing, too. Imagine how many trips it took to the well to do this. How many trips? They said they had, they had six, uh, uh, what was it, six, six stone jars, right? Six stone jars, and, and, and they were... What, 20 to 30 gallons? We'll assume there are 30 gallons. Six stone jars times 30 gallons is 180 gallons. 180 gallons is like a 55, three 55 gallon drums and then a little bit more of a half of another one. That's a lot of trips to the well. And these servants are going and they're just loading it up. They're just loading it up. Like, I don't know how long it took. It could have took them a half an hour. Like, what are you doing? We're just pouring water here, right? They're just loading up all this water, but they're being faithful with the water. Right? They're being faithful. Like Jesus said to do it, and I don't know. I don't get it, but I'm just going to bring some water, and I'm going to fill up the I'm just doing what Jesus told me. And it didn't seem like a miracle was even happening. It seemed like nothing was happening. And, and some of us, in our own life, we're like, I'm trying this, and it doesn't seem like it's working. I, I, I'm going to church every week, and it just doesn't seem like it's working. I'm giving, and, and it just doesn't seem like it's working. I, I'm praying, and it doesn't seem like it's working. I'm reading my Bible, and it just doesn't seem like it's working. We need to stay obedient. We need to stay focused. Keep dipping the water. Keep dipping the water. In your notes, keep serving. We should keep serving God even when it seems like nothing is happening. Man, they're loading up a lot of water here. They're filling up these. And they must be looking at each other like, like, what are we doing here? I don't know. I'm just, just, Mary said to do what he said. We're just putting the water here. Imagine how nervous these servants were. Uh, imagine the confusion that they felt. You know, it's like, like, okay, wait. We ran out of wine, so why are we getting water? Like, like we never ran out of water. Like, we had all the water. We, like, like what, why are we putting water in here? Maybe they, I know, Jesus had too much to drink. That's why we ran out of wine. He's going crazy now. He's telling us to put water in here. So they're filling it up, filling it up, filling it up. It says in James 1, 22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. See, it was important for them to do, to listen, to obey the words of Jesus. And he's saying, go and fill this up. And they fill it up, they, they dip it out, they bring it over to the, to the master ceremonies, essentially like the DJ, right? He's out there getting everybody doing, you know, the, the chicken dance or whatever it is they're doing. He's out there, and he's like, okay, well, we, we ran out of wine. And, and they bring him over some wine, and he drinks it. And what does he say? He, he, said, he said, everyone serves a good wine first when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you've kept the good wine until now. So, so normally, we, we serve the good stuff, then when everybody's a little bit drunk, then we give them the cheap stuff, you know? But, but now he drinks this and says, this isn't the cheap stuff. He's like, normally we go from the bottle to the box, but now we went from the box to the bottle, right? He's like, now you've got the good stuff. I, I got a bottle right here. This is, I guess it's a decent bottle of wine. I don't know. It's about a $70 bottle of wine, Okay. So, I mean, it's kind of expensive. I, I can't help but thinking, though, if Jesus made wine, it would probably be better than a $70 bottle of wine, right? I, I don't know. That's my guess. I don't think he would just give us something really cheap. So, um, so he, they made 180 gallons, okay? Do you know what that's like? That's like 900 bottles of wine. 
Now, if it was, yeah, wow. If it was, say, even $60 a bottle, that's $54,000 worth of wine. Jesus is like hooking them up. He's like, here, you've got enough. You've got enough for everybody. You've got enough for a while. Here, it's the good stuff. Everybody's like, wow, wow, this isn't the cheap stuff that we were drinking just a little bit ago. This is the high-end stuff. And see, this is what I believe in each of our lives, is in your notes, is that God's best is on its way. God's best is on the way for you in your own life. We, maybe we're sitting around, and it seems like, well, things aren't going that well, and then it runs dry, and God's like, hey, I got some good stuff for you. See, he can take even something that's mundane, even the water in our life, and he can turn it into something amazing. He can turn it into something good. See, the other thing I can't help but thinking about with this story is that Jesus could have done the whole miracle all on his own. He could have solved the problem all by himself. He could have snapped his fingers, and the water could have immediately filled up the jars, right? He could have just put the water in the jar. Or, why even need the water? Why don't we just skip that step? He could have snapped his fingers. He could have blinked his eyes. He could have done whatever he did, and immediately they would have had all the wine that they needed, right? He could have done that, but instead... He invited the servants to play a role in the miracle. He invited them, and they obeyed, and a miracle happened. See, he involved them with the process. The servants just did what they were told, and they saw a miracle happen. See, Jesus can make a miracle out of the mundane things. He's like, fill up the water. They're like, water, like, what, what is water? This is the most worthless thing that we have here. Like, this is the cheapest thing that we have. We don't need more water, Jesus. And he's like, just fill it up. And he takes the mundane, and he makes a miracle out of it. It didn't seem like much. Jesus is like, we, we, got, a, we got a miracle. You just add water, right? Just add a little bit of water. But where do we turn when our supply runs dry? Do we turn to our job? Do we turn to our education? Do we turn to our own skills and talents and abilities? Or do we turn like Mary did? We turn to Jesus. See, God specializes in transformation. And this miracle is a beautiful transformation of God taking something, Jesus taking something as simple as water and turning it into something that was the best wine probably ever to be on the face of this planet. Turning the natural into the supernatural. And all they did was they just brought him what they had. He's like, what do you got? We got some water. Then bring it and just fill it up. What if they'd given up halfway through? It's Jesus, like, show us what you're going to do, and then we'll finish this up. No, they just obeyed. And in our life, can we obey? Can we read? Can we pray? Can we give generously to do what we can do? Do what only we can do so that God can do what only God can do. See, I can't bring any wine to the table, but I can fill up a few jugs with some water. And that's all he's asking for us. He's asking for us to trust him and obey him and to get closer to him. And as we do that, we begin to see the natural become the supernatural as Jesus does a miracle in our life. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for this miracle of how you took something so simple as water and you brought transformation to it. Lord, we invite you to do the same in our life. Take the little that we have and make it into something special. Take our natural and make it supernatural, Lord. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, don't let another day go by. Tomorrow is not promised to us. Scripture says that if you believe God raised Jesus from the dead, and you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. Won't you call on his name now? Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. Won't you call on his name? God, we come to you. We thank you. We thank you for the goodness. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you for your provision. We thank you that even in the middle of the mundane of our life, you can do a miracle. We can thank you that, that even when we have troubles, even in the middle of crisis, we are at a prime opportunity for you to do a miracle, for the miraculous to happen. So we just give over our lives to you. We say, have your way in us and through us. Let us be your servants. Let us obey you. Let us listen to you. Let us do the things that you've invited us to do so that you can do the things that only you can do. And then and only then we can see the miraculous happen. Not because of who we are, 
but because of who you are, because you are good. You are a provider, you are a healer, and you are our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.